Ladies and gentlemen, earlier today, I was watching two of the absolute best chess players in the world going at it. Those are Kagus Marlsen and Nikaru Hakamura. They were playing a competition, and in this competition, they played one of the most magical and one of the best openings of all time against each other. In this video today, I'm going to be showing my attempt at this opening. So, let's get right into this video. Before we get started, I would really appreciate it if you guys could maybe subscribe to my channel, like the video. I'm trying to reach 1,000 subscribers by the end of 2024, and anything that you guys can do to help me out would be very appreciated. Thank you very much, but I do not want to make you wait too long, so let's get right into this. So, the opening starts with e4. The opponent plays e5. This opening is king e2. It's the bone cloud. Let's go. Nikaro Hakamura and Magnus Carlsen taught me that even in the face of adver adversity, you can still overcome and destroy your opponents. So in this challenge today, I'm going to be trying to beat my opponent not once, but twice using this very interesting opening. So let's see how the game went. The opponent plays knight to f6, trying to develop a piece, maybe also to attack that pawn. I move my knight up to develop and also to protect this pawn at the same time, which is the best move. The opponent develops another piece, being his bishop, to the c5 square. Just get that dark square bishop activated. I moved my pawn up here because I was trying to play like something like a Vienna Gambit or something. Even though I played the Bong Cloud. I don't really know. He takes, which is apparently a missed opportunity on his part. I'm not really sure why. I moved my knight up now to block that pawn from pushing any further and also to just develop another piece. And now he moves his pawn up. And now my plan is to push forward with my pawn onto the bishop. The opponent moves up his knight. This is a big blunder. Clearly. Because it just hangs a full bishop. I'm not sure what the logic was in that move at all. Might have been one of the worst moves possible. He takes the pawn back. And so now what I do is I take his pawn back with my bishop. Also developing another piece. But the best move here was actually trade queens. Because now my opponent would lose the right to castle. And then I should have taken the pawn. But he takes, it, he takes my queen. And I move my rook over. This actually isn't really that bad for me. Because I didn't have the right to castle in the first place. Because of this bond cloud opening. Which is one of the big reasons why this opening is never used competitively, other than Cagnus Marlson and Nikaru Hakamura. He castles now, getting his king to safety. Right now, pretty much none of his pieces are properly developed, other than his knight, which is very centered, but also very easily able to be pushed out. I just take a free pawn with my bishop. I would just like to note right now that I am winning by 5.33 points, even after this travesty and this pathetic opening. This is the best chess content that you will find on all of YouTube. I can kind of almost guarantee that. So subscribe right now because you do not want to miss my next video. Let's continue this game. He moves up his knight, just developing another piece. I might move my pawn up trying to kick out his, uh, his knight. It has to move back. And so now I attack it again with the other pawn. Now the knights are right next to each other attacking my pawn. I just get my knight more centered in the board. This isn't a great move, but... It's just a way to further develop my pieces, and I'm already winning, so as long as I don't make a huge blunder, I'm pretty much guaranteed to win this game. The opponent takes my pawn, trying to trade all a bunch of pieces in the center, and I'm good with this because I'm already winning. I'm up a full right knight right now, so anything that we can do to trade, simplify the position, is very nice for me. The opponent moves up his bishop, threatening my knight, so I have to move my king up, further developing my bone cloud opening to protect my knight. The opponent moves over his rook to uh, threaten my bishop, right in the center of the board. So I further activate my king, protecting my bishop, but also attacking his bishop. So my opponent, it seems like a pretty logical move, but what my opponent does is he moves up his pawn to protect the bishop. The best move here was to trade, however, but that's not what happened. And now what I do is I fork the king and the rook, and my opponent resigns. Let's check out the next game right now, where, despite using this opening, trying to challenge myself even further, I still do everything I can to try and beat my opponent. Do I win? Do I fail? You'll just have to watch and find out. So now, we're in the second game, and you probably already know how this opening goes. Pawn e4, pawn e5, king e2. I'm not really sure what opening this is. Maybe it's a French defense, but I could be completely wrong about that. I move my knight up again to just develop a piece. He checks my king with his bishop, and so now I kick it out with a pawn. He moves back to a pretty nice square. Bishop has a, a large feel on the board. And now I move my pawn up. I thrust it into the center to just 
open up the position a bit more. I don't like close positions that much, so that's why I did that. The opponent moves his knight up, which is a pretty good move, because he develops a piece and also wins a tempo, because I have to move my queen away because of his attack. I move my queen over to this square, trying to pin the knight to the king, but apparently it's not too good of a move, but I think it's kind of reasonable. Now the opponent makes an inaccuracy by moving his pawn up. I think the vision here was to move this pawn up and then move the B pawn up to B5 to also attack my queen. But he doesn't even end up doing this. I move my pawn up to try and create a, a, a getaway square for my queen. But he doesn't even do the idea that I saw. He just moves his knight up to develop it. Here I try to develop my knight. I want to try and get it to the F4 square. And this is the only way I could really do it. But... I guess this is an inaccuracy because Anna Rudolph always said that a knight on the rim is dim. We have a saying at chess that a knight on the rim is dim. I really need to follow that advice more. He develops another bishop, also giving him the opportunity to castle. So far, we both made some inaccuracies and some mistakes this game. I feel like that both of our moves have been so far kind of a uh, kind of reasonable, but it is what it is. I move my pawn up, threatening his knight, and he takes back. Now my queen has a double attack by the rook and by the pawn. So now I take back the pawn with the queen, trying to trade equal material, and also still keep a pin on that knight. But now that pin is gone because he castled out of the way. And I take another pawn with my queen. I probably should be taking more time here to actually develop my pieces, like the two bishops that are still in the back rank, and getting my king out of the way to more safety, instead of trying to win just some, some measly pawns. Because now he can just move his knight very easily into my position because none of my pieces are centralized and able to attack it. Back, trying to protect my pawn on c2. That way he doesn't move, take my pawn, and also attack my rook. Again, he makes a mistake because the knight on the rim is dim. Now I finally start to develop my two bishops by moving my bishop up to e3 and threatening that knight. He protects the knight with the pawn. And now I threaten his knight that is on the edge of the board with my pawn. And he just moves back to its original square. This whole sequence with the knight was a complete waste of time. I trade his knight for my bishop in the center of the board. And now my knight is under attack. So I move to another square. This knight is now protected by the queen and by the bishop. And maybe I can move forward to a square like c7 in the future. And create an attack on both his rook on a8 and his bishop on e6. He now moves his rook over to threaten my queen and also the knight behind it. What I was trying to do here is I was trying to bait him into taking the knight with his rook and maybe he wouldn't see that my bishop on f1 was protecting it because it's all the way on the other side of the board. But this didn't end up happening. He just moved his pawn forward, which is a much better move. I take the other pawn back. And now he moves his knight back to d7. I'm not really sure why he made this move. It doesn't seem very logical to me because now he leaves the g7 pawn, which is a very weak pawn in his position. So I take with my pawn. And now he sees a pretty good move, which is an attack on my queen and the rook behind it. So when I move out of the way, he takes my rook with his bishop, a free rook. As we can see, after this opening, I've not been succeeding too well. This challenge has been very rough on me. But I see one final opportunity that I have to win this game. I, if I'm going to win, I have to checkmate him, and I have to checkmate him fast. Because he has a very large advantage on me. So I move my knight up. And this knight has two different tactics on it. I have a large attack on his bishop on e6 with my queen, my knight, and my pawn. As well as, if he doesn't make a productive move, like this move right here, I have a very powerful move, the best move in this position, a checkmate in one move. My opponent hung checkmate in one move. Nikaro Hakamura was right about something. It's not about who makes the most blunders or the biggest blunders. It's about who makes the last blunder. This game is a perfect example of that. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Subscribe, like I said at the beginning. I want to reach 1,000 subscribers. If you guys could help me achieve that goal, I would be so excited. It, it would just mean the world for me. So, I hope you enjoyed. See ya.